today's podcast, I'm going to discuss two listener requests. And as I am now doing to help you guys out, because I know all of you don't have a lot of time to listen to uh, a long podcast episode, I will be putting the timestamps uh, in the either the description box or the comment section. Okay, so two listener requests. One of my listeners asked, what are my thoughts on Nick Cannon? For those of you like me who didn't know, Nick Cannon has, I don't know if this is a pie. I'm looking at it now. I don't know if this is a podcast or a show. Like, I don't know. The guy has so much stuff, but I know he has a YouTube channel called Council Culture Show. So, you know, it's the play on cancel culture, but this is council culture, like you counsel someone. So council culture, and he had a conversations with Iyala Van Zandt called the deadbeat debate where in essence, in this podcast episode, um, he asked her, basically, am I Debbie dad? You know, he, he talks about the, the um, criticisms he's faced with his, you know, having 12 different children by uh, uh, several different women, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to listen to a little bit of the podcast as well. Then we're going to tackle the next uh, listener topic, which was Terry Crews. Um, Terry Crews sat down with Shannon Sharp on his Club Shay Shay podcast a few days ago. And of course, liked all the people he was talking about his life, etc. But uh, one of my listeners said, you know, it came to a point in that podcast where he was talking about cheating on his wife. Um, but it sounded like he was admitting to, to more than cheating. She said, it seems to me that he actually was coming out on that podcast. And we had talked about Terry Crews a few months back. Um, when the whole Christian keys thing was going on, if you recall, people were like, oh, see, you know, uh, this is why men don't come out, da, 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 you know, and Christian is so brave and da, 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 da. And I was one of those people saying he was so brave until we later found out the impetus for him doing that, <laughs> that whole live. And we realized, oh, he played us all right. But they were saying people owe Terry Crews an apology because remember, Terry Crews had come out with his situation. So I went through an an entire podcast episode explaining why nobody owes Terry Crews an apology because Terry Crews' situation was actually different in people's eyes. And we went through uh, the whole rumor that he was bisexual. So we went through all that. Now, anywho, so let's jump into it. Uh, What I want to first do is I want to talk about the Nick Cannon situation. I've actually got it pulled up here. And let me tell you how I do when I research for my podcast. I don't have a lot of time. I'm like you. I'm very busy. And my podcast is actually a hobby. Okay. So I normally listen to these things on two. What does that mean? You can change the playback speed from the normal uh, speaking pace to speed it up. So sometimes when you speed it up, it sounds like, (laughs) but you can get through something quickly. You can cut down an hour podcast into 30 minutes by speeding it up. So you're going to be listening to it with me. I've already listened to it, but I'm going to re. Uh, play a portion of it for you. Uh, It's going to be on two. They were not speaking this fast, but the purpose of me playing this is not for you to actually like enjoy listening to it per se. It's just to get the information so you can see what I'm talking about. I will put the links. um, Well, I've already given you the title so you can go back on YouTube and research it yourself and you can listen to it for your enjoyment. And uh, let's see, where do I start it here? Even in the space of my career, I have so much you know, people counting their kids and they're counting their relationships. Okay, let's start here. Because one of the drum lines was off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I was asking you that, how did it feel and how did you feel? You know, people counting their kids and they're counting their relationships. I, 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 when do you take that? What do you do with that? We talked about or you brought up in our last session inadequacy yeah. in a space of even... It's very important to listen to this part. Um, I've done many things. I've been doing this for over three decades. And there's been expectations. There's been great achievements. But as I sit here as a man in his 40s, um, and the common conversation about me is, you know, me and my 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 frugalness <laughs> or, or what relationship I'm in or no longer in or who I'm dating when I feel like when I'm thinking legacy when I'm thinking all that I have to offer if that's the main remembrance if that's the thing which is great I want to be remembered as a, a father and you know that, that is my first priority in life but I feel like even in the space of my career I have so much to offer from spaces like this to you know the arts to you know the, the opportunities I've provided for many other artists but the day to day conversation the thing mm-hmm. that goes by with the thing that people are constantly talking about is what's the lowest common denominator yeah. though and here the low frequency yeah, the, the, no it's not and actually that's what Occupied in your life and negligent of their own. Mm. Negligent of their own. Right. I think you have 10 kids, 11, yeah, whatever. Go, 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 whatever you I'm not saying that. <laughs> I, don't know what I, I, mean, I did a show with somebody that had 34. You know what's funny too? And like, there's like a screenshot uh, that they put my face on. Or like, they, 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 the dolls, they always put my face on it. They're not going to wait for this moment. Uh-huh. Like, they thought you were going to bring the dolls with you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, in that Here it is, I, guys. I, I, I Listen to this. Because even in the space that says right now, there's over 17 million, you know, 
children that are in, you know, non-nuclear households, right? with, you know, however it is, single parent, however you choose to define it. Um, and I want to tell you two terms that I want to unpack. The first term uh, I want to bring up is, you know, a deadbeat dad or deadbeat father. I hear that a lot. I hear that term thrown around about, you. about me and many others are just men that, you know, may not be in your traditional relationship. And then the other term that I hear quite a bit is uh, a broken home, mm -hmm. creating broken homes. Um, I struggle with those things because obviously I don't want to be associated or a part of either one of those, but in asking you, if these terms uh, do apply, I mean, I want to take accountability. Uh, for them, but I, I want to know what we feel the definition of those are, and then not only just for myself, for someone who may not be in your traditional or conventional relationship, how can we be the best fathers to our multiple children? Or how do we mend the broken households that we may have? Created? Okay, I'm going to stop it there. So this right here, for my listener who asked me, is a perfect example of what I've been saying for the last several months about society at large. So let's review that. Okay, so here we have a very wealthy celebrity, Nick Cannon, sitting down with Iyanla Van Zant, who is a life coach guru. Um, and she has some other accolades in terms of her um, study, her, uh, you know, theology degrees, etc. But he's sitting down with her for the purpose of this right here. Let's redefine what deadbeat dad is. And broken home means because I don't want to be labeled as such. And if I truly am this, I want to take accountability. So this podcast episode is 38 minutes. His, the whole purpose is that what I just told you. Okay. Remember, I've been sharing that in my view, my opinion, we are in a heck of a mess in society at large. So when I say society, I'm not just speaking of the United States of America, although most of us are based here in the States. I'm speaking as a whole. And one of the, um, one of the red flags of how very twisted our world has become is this right here. People who want to redefine terms and terminology to make themselves feel okay with the bad decision or choices that they're making or have made. Having whole conversations over the meaning of the word dead be dad or the phrase dead be dad. Having whole podcast episodes over the meaning of a broken home. When we all know what a dead be father is, we all know what a broken home is. But the purpose of this conversation is, does that apply to me? And if so, I want to take accountability, which if you listen to the entire thing, she does exactly what he brought her on there for. He, she says, no, you're not because a deadbeat father is this and a deadbeat father is that and a broken home is this. And so that doesn't apply to you. And of course, he feels great by the end of this, that he is not a deadbeat father. He is not creating broken homes. He is just in a non-traditional family setup, which is. As he quotes there, 17, according to, I don't know where he got that stat from. So I can't say whether it's accurate or not because I couldn't research it because he didn't give this, he didn't cite his source. Um, but according to him, 17 million children, uh, and I don't know if that's globally, if, is that just the U.S.? Like, I don't know, you know, some things about that stat. But basically he's saying 17 million children are in non-traditional household setups or family, non-traditional family setups. But I can promise you out of those 17 million, they were not purposely made. And that's the difference between Nick Cannon's situation and these 17 million. They were not purposely made. No person, no loving, loving man and loving woman gets together to purposefully create a deadbeat father or mother or a broken home situation. That is not in anyone's, you know, zeitgeist. That's not what people are out there doing. It happens, but it's not happening on purpose. On the other hand, he is doing it on purpose and he needs somebody to make him feel okay with that. Stay with me. So I've been sharing with you guys over and over and over that this right here is exactly what's happening in society. So let me get back to the point. Why are people setting about trying to redefine everything? Like I always give the example of affairs because that's something simple that we all can understand and discuss. Why? We are becoming our own gods. And when we are our 
own God. We decide what's right, what's wrong, what's evil, what's good. We make up our own rules. We can move the line 15,000 times. We can say, oh, today lying is okay, but tomorrow it may not be. We can say, okay, it's okay to sleep around with someone who's married, which is a covenant. And if it's legal, it's a legal covenant. It's okay to be a covenant breaker. It's okay to have an affair. It's okay to lie. It's okay to steal. It's okay. I mean, I will tell you something that really, really disappointed me um, is that when we were discussing the Fonnie Willis, Nathan Wade affair, I actually saw people in our community. I don't know if they were visitors or regular listeners who were saying, who cares that she slept with him? Who cares that she hired her boyfriend? Who cares? There's no impropriety there. That's not a conflict of interest. And listen to this. The white folks been doing it forever. The Trump folks been doing it too. So then we are supposed to emulate our oppressors. We're supposed to be just as evil, just as down low, just as dirty. We're not supposed to rise up higher. So our our barometer for morality is what the white folks going to do or what those who oppress our people are doing. So this right here is exactly what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, we're seeing this in real time. We're seeing someone actually do that. Unfortunately, excuse me, not unfortunately, but typically people are doing this in their own heart and mind and soul and spirit. They're saying to themselves, again, let me just go back to an affair. Well, we all know what an affair is. An affair, okay, is when any man or any woman, be they single or married, are sleeping around having sex with someone else's spouse. Okay. But what is a marriage? A marriage is a legal agreement between two people. Okay. Man and woman to come together in a bond, in a relationship and build a home, a family, a life, et cetera, et cetera. And it is legal. And because it's legal, they get certain benefits via the tax, you know, code, et cetera, et cetera. And the legal document matters. That's why same sex people were fighting so long to get married because there are benefits to being legally married. There are financial benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So We all know what an affair is. We all know what it is to be married. But yet now, see now in this world where uh, we call wrong, right and right, wrong, because the world is twisted. Okay, we now say, well, wait a minute. I know that he is if I'm a woman, I know he is legally married to his wife, but they don't they don't live together anymore. So I'm not having an affair. Or we'll say something like, well, I mean, they don't get along. I mean, he's just with her because of the kids. He's just waiting for their kids to grow up. So, yeah. So, I mean, this is not an affair because he, he's not, he's done with her anyway. Their relationship has been over. They're just you're doing it because of the kids. See, we give our, we make up, excuse me. See, we redefine what an affair is to why make ourselves okay with the wrong we're doing. And why are we doing that? Why are we taking time in our minds, our hearts, in this case on a whole podcast uh, with these two folks? To make it okay because we are our own God. And the most dangerous thing, the most dangerous thing for any human being, for any society at large, is for people to make up their own rules. That's why we have laws. That's why we have speeding uh, laws. That's why we have, excuse me, uh, laws about the road and transportation. Because if we all just made up our own thing, we would have chaos. And look at our society. Do we not have chaos? I think it's very interesting that he brought Iyanla instead of somebody else. See, somebody else would have told him the truth. They would have said, listen, you, you, you're trying to align yourself with the 17 million folks out there, according to your statistics, that are in non-traditional families. But, but that wasn't what they went out, set out to do. You are not them. <laughs> See, somebody else would have told him the truth. Okay. But Iyanla You know, let me say this. I enjoy Iyanla Van Zandt. I do. I think Iyanla, I know Iyanla has helped so many people and that is to be praised. It really is because if we can help just one person, we've done something with our lives, y'all. We really have. And she's helped thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. I, I dare not go to the million mark, but she's helped so many people change their lives. But she's also given permission to, for people to do things that really are not good in, for their best interest. Like um, not too long ago, 
I want you to listen to this. Not too long ago, she was a guest on The Breakfast Club. This was before Jess Hilarious got there. And she was saying that now, you know, now, mind you, Jan was like 70, 70 and, and over, or maybe she's right at 71. But she was saying, you know, she has no problem, you know, being in an open relationship. Why? I want you to listen to what she said her reason was. Because, you know, at my age, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, want to have sex like that. So it's okay for him to go. So that was her reason. See, again, I, I, I would like to be in a marriage, but I don't want to do what a woman or if it's the man's duty in a marriage to do, which is to, yes, make sure that your body is now theirs. And a part of keeping a marriage together is the sexual aspect of that. It's not all of it, but it is a very important part. Well, I don't want to do that. So I'm okay with him going and having, she even said, get you a woman in your forties who's going to be willing to do, you know, all of this, you know? And this is a woman who says that she is godly. So I don't know what her definition of godly is. Now, again, people can say, well, folks can do whatever they want. I know they sure can because they are their own gods. Let me get back to this. The worst thing in society is when we became our own gods, when we stopped having a standard as society. And yet we all know standards work. It keeps things in order. Again, I mentioned earlier the speed limit. I mentioned, I'm going to now mention other things. Think about your neighbor. If you own your own home, there's a boundary line, right? Part of, this is your property. This is where your property starts and stops. This is where their starts and stops. See, a standard, a boundary is there to keep things in order. And without boundaries, chaos, uh, you know, erupts. What if you looked into your backyard and here is your neighbor putting up a clothesline in your backyard between your two trees. And so you go out there and you say, what, in the, what are you doing? What are you doing, Shelly? And they say, oh, well... Child, I needed to expand. Listen, my dryer and washer have gone out. And so I got to go back to the old school way. And so, uh, you know, I didn't have enough room in my backyard. So I thought I'd use yours. And you say, but no, this is my property. You can't set up a clothesline in my property. So see, on the natural sense of things, we all understand the the necessity of standards, boundaries, having a line. This right here, we can't cross. We can't go that far. And yet when it comes to how we live our own lives, we don't understand how we live our own lives affects society. It either adds to the building of it or it adds to the, or it takes away from it. It tears it down. And so you have people going around saying people can do whatever they want to do. I agree that people can do whatever they want to do, but I also believe people need to be making um, well thought out decisions because their decisions do affect other people. If no one else, but their neighbor. Okay, now let's go to uh, this right here. I can promise you if he would have had someone else on here, they would not have agreed with him. See, they wouldn't have given him what he what he wanted. And that, you know, so all of this stuff right here. Listen, just be careful. Okay, now, what do I think about Nick Cannon? I think that Nick Cannon is no different than the rapper Future. The only uh, difference, if we could just go say if there is a difference, is that um allegedly future doesn't financially care for his children, nor does he even come see them. Whereas this, this young man is saying that he does financially support his children and their mamas. And he also comes to see them. Listen to this when he can. So what happens in these types of situations is that people have children, but sometimes they don't think about are my decisions best for the child? Oh, it's good for me. I don't know why Nick Cannon said about having 12 children, and I don't think he's done, um, despite what he may say. Something happened in his life because it seemed to me his life was going in one direction. And then all of a sudden, he started having these children by all these different women. When we see people who have lived a certain way, and then all of a sudden, they change and they're now beginning to make very destructive decisions. There wasn't, there was some sort of catalyst that happened. Um, maybe he found out from his doctor, he only has 10 years to live, or maybe he found out that his lupus is getting worse. And he said, listen, I'm not going to leave all this money to the government. I'm going to have children so they can, you know, who knows what his, his, his thinking was, but for a man to set out to have 12 different children and counting by six or seven different women, who he is not married to. There may be some sort of, you know, this crazy stuff people do. We, we had a, you know, I don't know what they call it. These spiritual 
union, whatever, you know, again, that goes back to people trying to redefine things. And you say, but that's what our ancestors did. Well, check this out. We're not our ancestors. Thank God for them, but we're not them. And we're not living in that society. We're living in the United States of America where being legally married is a benefit to you. It's a benefit to your children. You know, it's so crazy the way our world is. You know, you have a, a, a woman who has kids and let's say they're four and they're all by different guys and they each got a different last name, but they're all siblings. You see, it's just cre- confusion, 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 confusion. Is this your brother? Yes, my brother, but his daddy is such and such. such. Yeah, confusion, confusion, confusion. And again, it's one thing when things aren't, you know, people just make bad decisions, but this guy set out to do this. This is different. This was on purpose. So I don't think there's a difference between these two. I think he is a deadbeat dad. Why? Because being a father is much more than providing. We all know that. How do we know that? Because we know what a father is. We know what the definition of a father is. And see, we shouldn't let people come along and try to redefine it because see, they're this new kind of father. You see, they're this new father. And that is exactly what's happening. You know, I've said this for years, even before the whole Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith thing unraveled, is that a lot of you were with me. This probably was five and a half years ago. I said, these people are going around touting dysfunction as a new level of enlightenment. You see, we're no longer married. We're life partners. See, you can only hope to attain what we've attained. And yet I said to people, they haven't attained anything. Selfishness is nothing new. Dysfunction is nothing new. You can give it every kind of a new name and a new, you know, spiritual name is still the same. And now look at it. Now they've come out and told what we think is a truth girl. They lie so much. Who knows that they haven't even been together for seven years. Why? 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 Because they're not happy. (laughs) They don't want each other, (laughs) but they want the benefits of that marriage license. You see? So, uh, We should want to be like you, not happy. Chow, please. Okay. Bye. (laughs) So those are my thoughts about this whole Nick Cannon situation. I think this conversation was really sad. I think that um, Nick needs to feel right about what he's doing. You say, but he ain't doing nothing wrong. Okay, girl, listen, I ain't got time to talk to you because see, you're a part of what's wrong with the society. Listen, folks, we've got to have boundaries. We have to have rules for ourselves. We have to have something higher than us to say there is a standard and I must either come to that standard or at least try, spend my life trying. I mean, you think, you know, I used to think about this and I'm asking you to think about it too. When I used to work with abused children and adults and, and, and do those classes and stuff, I used to say to myself, wow, If all of us just would have done what God said, none of this stuff would have happened. What am I, what do I mean? Now I'm a Christian, so I'm taking what God said from the Holy Bible. Okay. Now I, um, believe in freedom of religion and I actually respect people's difference of religion. That's why I don't come over here Bible thumping and stuff. I respect the fact that you have a right to believe in who and what you want and, and think whatever is the Holy book for you. Okay, because I don't want anyone telling me that I don't have a right to believe for my life that the Bible is going to be my guidebook. I respect that you don't want it to be yours. No problem here. That's not how I am because I understand this. This thing cuts to both ways. Okay, but in my Bible, okay, it tells me right that God has a standard and I'm supposed to live up to that standard or at least spend my life trying. And when I miss the mark, I'm supposed to ask for forgiveness right? I'm not supposed to be out here just doing any old thing because I can. But however, I also understand God gave every human being the gift of free will. It's a gift and a curse. He said, I set before you life and death. Now you choose. See, that's the free will. God's not making any choices for folks, despite what people want to say. But the fact that this guy is out here creating broken homes, he is. What is a broken home? When a child has to grow up and not have access to their parents the way they need. This guy has a million jobs, okay? Uh, And he's got 12 different children who live in different parts of of the United States of America with different women. 
I mean, you know how difficult it is, and I don't even know, but some of you know how difficult it is to be a hands-on full-time parent to just one or two or three kids, especially when all the kids have different personalities. They may have different needs. You can't be in 12 places at the same time. You can't go to 12 different baseball games that may be on the same day or in, in the vicinity, and you got a million jobs on top of it. This was highly selfish. Listen, this was an act of selfishness on Nick Cannon's part. It wasn't an act of freedom. It wasn't an act of new uh, fatherhood. It wasn't an act of creating uh, a different type of family. It was an act of selfishness. He was thinking about himself. Although I'm sure if I were to sit down and talk to him, he would say he was thinking about creating more millionaires or I I, I just know that this man has some sort of distort. Something happened. I keep going back to that. Something happened that made him think that this type of stuff was okay. He did try it the traditional way, you know, a marriage and having kids. And now think about this. He goes around talking about how in essence, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing his words, but in essence, how you know, he still loves his ex-wife and really wished that he could have stayed with her and made it work. Well, it's too late now. I mean, you don't, you know, had all these kids. So I think when we are thinking about children, we'll make different decisions. Children need parents who are there, even if they can't be in the same household. Again, not because that's what someone purposely set out to do like this fool, but no, somebody, something happened, the divorce, um, somebody's not healthy. So we had to end this. But when children know I can, daddy, daddy is here. I have access. But when I used to, to do that work, I used to just say, if only we would, you know, have not done what, you know, did what God said. None of this, all the, all the people I used to have clients have all these venereal diseases. You know, they got chlamydia, they got syphilis, they got, uh, what was the other one? The big one, herpes, the one that won't go away. And, you know, you just think to yourself, if we would have just followed what God said, if that had been our standard, to not fornicate, to not sleep around. You say, well, folks can get diseases when they get married. Yeah, but can you, can you be commonsensical? Okay. And, uh, and say, and understand that the, the, the stats are very low compared to people just sleep around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. If people are screwing around during their marriage, yeah, they're exposing their spouse to sexually, uh, sexual diseases. Yeah. But that compared to people just sleeping around. See, my Bible tells me to avoid fornication. This is Corinthians to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. But if you can, and he says, if you can't contain, go on and marry because it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Listen, God made us sexual. And so we have these desires And God is saying, God is through the apostle Paul to us as Christians, not to the whole world, to us as Christians saying, Hey, there's a way to do this. Don't torment yourself with burning sexually so that you go out and start doing all this, making very poor decisions that are going to affect your life. And then you create a little human being who now you're going to be responsible for. And guess what? They have needs. They have emotional needs. They have spiritual needs. They have mental needs. And it goes beyond just being able to provide a good education and a house and a car and and clothes and shoes. When you got to divide your time between a thousand jobs and 12 different children and you still ain't done, that that is putting a level of even stress on yourself that's unnecessary. I mean, you already got lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. And all of us know that stress, okay, compounds autoimmune diseases, (laughs) And then just think about it. Then you had a child that died. So see, that was a stress in your life that wouldn't have even happened to you. So we create our own problems so many times. And then we say, wow, life is so hard. No, we make bad decisions that then make our lives hard. So for my listener, that's what I think about Nick Cannon. Now let's go to Terry Crews. Um, Let me pull up something here about Terry. So because I'm not going to, hold on y'all, because... Hold on, guys. I'm sorry. Just a second. I'm looking at something here. Okay, here we go. So um, because I'm not going to go into all of my thoughts about Terry Crews, because I've already given that time on the initial podcast about Terry Crews, I go into his background. I go into the pictures of Terry uh, on and on and on. I'm just going to link that in either the description box with the timestamps or the comment section. Okay, so please understand. I'm just going to be scratching the surface on this topic. So 
after listening to Terry Crews, this is for my listener who asked me, I agree with you. I definitely think he was coming out. I don't know. Excuse me, guys. My stomach is growling. I don't know if if it's because of what you were saying that. Um, let me think. Yeah, you were saying that you think his, he, he may have done this to try to get ahead of a story. Well, that's possible because chow, everybody's trying to get them a check. <laughs> Aren't they? I mean, you got people. What's that guy? The latest guy we talked about who's suing uh, Sean Diddy Combs. I mean, he named everybody in his lawsuit. He up here talking about um, Meek Mill slept around with. Like, what does Meek Mill have to do with? What does him having sex with Sean Puffy Comb? Or I like to say sexual contact um, uh, because I don't believe anal sex is is a form of sex. I know that's what we call it. So I don't need anyone trying to tell me anything in the comments. I know it's what we call it. But the anus was never created to be entered. Okay. We all understand that. (laughs) That's why people develop certain diseases when they constantly have that entered because the digestive system starts in the mouth and it ends at the anus. The anus is a part of the digestive system. And when you are constantly you know, doing things that you shouldn't be doing with the anus, you're opening up your body to all types of bacterial things that should never have been there. And so over time, bacteria, you know, well, you can research it out, but in, uh, over time, bacteria begins, you know, foreign things that the body can't fight off, begin to attack the immune system, creating autoimmune immune diseases. And you know what I'm talking about. So the anus was never created as anything sexual. It's, it's not to be that. Okay. And so for me, when I hear these things, I know we say anal sex. I just like to say con- sexual contact or anal contact. Okay. But I'm like, what does Meek Mill having anal contact with? <laughs> Why are we telling all this? Like this man means to get the biggest check he can possibly get. <laughs> and I think he's telling all this because he knows if all these people say, listen, now he's putting my business in the street, given what he's asking for, he's asking for $40 million or whatever it is, give it to him so he can shut up. Right. So actually it's kind of comical just how far people are willing to go to get their check. But at any rate, um, during this conversation with Terry Crews, Terry basically goes on to talk about what he's talked about forever. But what was very interesting to me for my listener was the way he framed it. It was very different. So this is why I'm saying I agree with you that he did come out without coming out. So in this um, interview, he talks about how 14 years ago, he decided to come to his wife and share with her that he had been cheating on her. Um, But he keeps saying, I decided to tell her who I really am, who I really am, who I really am. And um, he says, I, I had suspected all of our relationship that she suspected who I really was, but she was just waiting for me to tell her. So the more he's saying this, it's very, you, you hear, wait a minute, cheating is an act. It's not who you are. You know what I'm saying? Cheating is an act. It's not a being, right? So obviously he's talking about something else. So he goes on in this interview and I will try to link it for you guys so you can listen to it again for your own enjoyment and pleasure. And then he goes on to say that, listen, he decided to tell her and he was saying, you know, hey, I understand if you decide to not stay with me. And she says, to my surprise, I'm staying with you. And he says that was 14 years ago and we are now... We, that was 20. We were at 20 years of marriage then 14 years ago. Now we're in 34 years of marriage. And he says, I can now be who I am. <laughs> See, that's not someone talking about cheating. That's someone saying, I, I've been this person. She always suspected it, but now I've told her and she's okay with it. And I will bet you guys anything. And I didn't do the, the numbers here, but on that other podcast, I talked about the time when Terry Crews started being seen with purses and, wearing, you know, women's attire and such and such and such and such in other countries. I bet you if I did the time, you know, the time elapsed, it would be around that time that he told his wife, because that was when he started being seen out with purses. And it's like, he had never been seen that. Like what? And people were like, what is Terry Crews doing? Okay. Why is Terry Crews all of a sudden doing all these things? And he was like, it's a stance against toxic masculinity. It's like, there are a lot of things you could do to take a stand against toxic masculinity, but carrying a purse. (laughs) Okay. That's extreme. No, that's something else. And so I really think that, um, for my listener, I think that that's what it was. And again, you know, cheating is an act and we say, well, cheat a person could be a cheater. But if you think about, remember we talked about, I think, This was on, I'm trying to think which podcast we touched on this, 
this um, life principle. I think it was, we talked about Jonathan Majors, Megan Good, and Jay Hud in common. We talked about how we can, I'm going to use this word um, because this is just the best way to describe it, how we can predict behavior. So we know that future behavior can be predicted based on a person's pattern, right? And when it comes to trying to um, figure out kind of what, why a person did what they did or what their behavior means, generally speaking, what we're supposed to do is go to the standard. Like, what does this behavior typically mean? Okay. Because we've all heard that saying that there's an exception to every rule. So there are rules, which would be the standard, but there is an exception. But what we also have to remember is that exceptions are very rare. So when we say there's an exception to every rule, yeah, there is, but they're very rare. They're very rare. And so I was saying on that podcast, all of us, no matter what the circumstance of situation, we should assume we're going to be the rule and not the exception. And we always flip it, especially if it's in relationships. We say, oh, I know he cheated on every woman before me. See, that's the rule. That's the standard. That's how the person, that's how the man is. But see, I, see, see, our love is different. See, 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 I'm going to be, I'm going to love him the way he really needs to be loved. See, we're assuming we're going to be the exception there instead of taking the standard behavior and applying it. Okay. So having said all that, Generally speaking, when a person is speaking about exposing their cheating to their husband or their wife, they're not framing it as who I am. I'm going to tell them who I am. They frame it as I'm going to tell them what I say it with me did, not who I am, (laughs) because most cheaters don't see themselves as cheaters. They see that that I made a bad decision. I, I, you know, made a mistake, but they don't see themselves as a cheater, which is normally a terrible person like we all of us know cheaters what we think about cheaters. Cheaters are low down. They're no good. And so nobody wants to be with a cheater. So most people don't align their identity with something negative. Okay. So he was framing it in a very interesting way. Not what I did. I'm going to finally tell her what I did and and say, you can stay with me or not. And he said, I was prepared for her to walk away and I was going to be okay with it. Right. He said, because I couldn't live a lie anymore. See, all that kind of talk That's someone talking about, as my listener rightly said, in my view, my opinion, more than cheating. He exposed more than cheating to her. And we have to understand that. When men, um, men who um, and I just learned this, just actually, this podcast has, has helped me learn so much because I had to do so much research to discuss certain topics. Um, But I've learned from various things we've talked about over the years about these men who are bisexual. And it seems that they typically try to um, scope out a woman who's also bisexual so that they are okay with it. Kind of like Jill and what Jill, excuse me, not Jill, Will and Jada. I was trying to combine their names, Jill, Will and Jada, right? She's bisexual. He's bisexual. So, or get whatever, you know, so then, and normally people like that, you know, they have these, what we really call the arranged marriages where it's like, okay, you know, he's gay or she's gay, whatever. And so, but we want a kid. So let's do this. You get what I'm saying? And so I feel like, um, when I was listening to that conversation, I noticed Shannon's body behave, his body language. One thing I've noticed about Shannon Sharp, and the more I have done stories on Shannon, the more I've had to research on Shannon. And again, going back to what I said earlier, taking the standard, taking what this behavior typically means to then predict what this currently means, you know, so on and so forth. I noticed something about him on his podcast. Have you guys ever noticed this? You probably already knew it. When he's talking to a man who he either knows is gay or knows is bisexual or suspects as such, he puts his leg up on the um, coffee table And he exposes his genital genitals, because in my opinion, if Shannon Sharp is gay, the way I suspect he is, he is he plays the female role. You know how these people take on these roles. And so I notice he does that. But with men who were on there, like Steve Harvey, maybe or somebody else who he either knows is not gay, knows is not bisexual, knows would never go down for that. Or he's not trying to scope it out and see he does not do that. That's very interesting because see, as women, how do we behave in front of a man that we're interested in uh, or a man we're trying to see if he's interested in us? We do certain behaviors. Now, we don't gap our legs open. I don't mean that. But I mean, we do things like flip our hair or flip our weave, flip our wig, whatever. We smile a little bit more. We start giving off these body language um, cues to try to gauge the, the man's interest. And so I noticed that he does that. And so with 
Terry child, he plopped his leg up there. I mean, I was like, you can so easily see his penis. And he does seems to be, he seemed to be packing y'all. Okay. I'm like, God, I mean, and then he wears the tight and tight clothes. <laughs> I'm just thinking, I'm sorry, y'all. I had the visual in my head. <laughs> Child. But anyway, so the man, he's so fine, you know, he's so ripped and his, his muscles are so tight that when he opens his legs, you know how it is. You can't help but see, <laughs> you know, it's like, dang, what? Shannon, come on now. Um, but so I'm like, look at this man. He's just gapping his leg all the way up. And then I, I, I noticed in his behavior, he'll take his cue cards and he'll cover his penis up and then he will frequently remove the cue card. You know, um, so at any rate, those are my thoughts. I agree with you. I think he was admitting that he exposed who he really was to his wife. And um, who knows? You may be right. Maybe someone uh, has the story. Maybe he and his wife will, um, you know, all these people are looking for checks, y'all. We got to remember, as I said before, COVID did a number on these celebrities. These people were not having it the way you and I thought they were. Like all the folks that I thought was so rich and that you thought were so rich and oh my goodness, they didn't have it like that. A lot of those people were like us. They were living paycheck to paycheck or they were just two or three paychecks away from disaster. And COVID was a disaster. And so um, they are doing anything. So who knows if the story is going to come out? Maybe he and his wife, because they've had reality shows before. Maybe this will be a new reality show, you know, for them of him, you know, sharing how he came out to her. And remember what Bruce, um, Bruce Jenner said when this is when he was Bruce. Remember, he said with the Diane Sawyer interview, which I've, I've recounted this to you guys before, which really shocked me. He said, Diane asked him, were you honest with Chris Jenner? And he said, Chris knew. He said, um, it came a time when she used to catch me at home in women's clothes because um, he had his own wardrobe. And then there came a time when she was OK with it. And she would say things to me like, OK, it's time to take that off and get back in your, I guess, your men clothes. OK. And he said. Had she been okay with it, we would still be married. He said, and she was okay with it until it got to a point where I was saying, okay, I'm tired of hiding who I am. I want to go public with this. And that's when she wanted a divorce. So there are, I think, women, if what you and I and others suspect about Terry Crews, if it's true, his wife, according to him, is okay with that. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate all of you. Listen, what I would love to read, and I'm sure all the people who are going to listen to the podcast would love to read as well, is your thoughts, okay? Your thoughts on Terry Crews' interview on Club Shay Shay. Um, Your thoughts about Nick Cannon, his sit down with Ayala Van Zandt about the conversation about deadbeat dads. I appreciate all of you. Again, this is just my view, my opinion. Drop down in the comments and let us know yours. I'll talk to you on, yes, the next podcast. Bye, guys.